Welcome to the Limitless Life Podcast. I am your host, Kyle Smith. And with me today is Andy Sador. And Andy Sador is the owner of Next Level Fit, and he's been in the industry 18 years. A big believer in all goals of being attainable in a lifetime of dedication to the health and fitness world. Thank you very much for being here, Andy. I appreciate it a ton. You are very welcome. So before going into many questions, I just want to acknowledge a couple of things I really admire about you. Uh, And it's, well, one, I admire the fact that uh, you are, how old are you? Uh, I turned 60 in a couple of weeks. So you are, you are, in my mind, you are, you you have such a great physique for a 60 year old. And I think it's, I think it's so important for folks to realize that like, in my mind, health is wealth. And I think that you are an awesome example of that where people think, oh yeah, at this age, and I think that the age concept, like we should do certain things by certain ages. I think that's bullshit. And I think the fact that you are just still crushing it at the age of 60, not only crushing it physically, but something that I really admire is your, uh, you're taking your, your, your working, you're like, you're a hard worker and I admire that. Uh, and whether I, I think it's something that I, I admire because for me, I don't see myself wanting to retire. Even if I had the ability to retire, I think I would get really bored with my um, exactly. own existence. And I like I like thinking of it like this, and this is something that you inspired in me. So I think that, uh, I think that until the day I can no longer be a positive contribution to the human race, I'll keep working until the day I die. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think you. that, and I think that some, that's something that you do. And I think it's really admirable and you're, you're kicking ass. Like you're there like six times a, a week and you're coaching all of these clients on like being healthier and everything like that. So I just wanted to uh, acknowledge you for your dedication, for your passion, for your persistence, which is the same as dedication. Oh, but thanks. I think that you're really, you're a really cool person. And I think that uh, you. you break, you actually chop down a lot of things that people expect like retirement or at a certain age, you let things go. You're the opposite. You're not the social norm. And I think that I admire that in you. And I'm not sure if you're aware of that thanks. as a characteristic, but it's awesome. Well, thanks. Well, what I try and do too is all you guys I love working around you guys. You guys are all so smart. So I get a little piece off of each of all of you guys, as well as all of you, all of you guys and girls are a lot younger than me. So you keep me young. So it's like looking at how you guys say you might look up to me because of this or that. I look up to all of you for the education, everything I learn off of you guys. And the fact that you're so into it and just being around young people helps keep you young as well. And uh, you guys are all good role models as well. So it's like, it's give and take. That's what it's about. Uh, totally as agree. far as breaking down the barriers, like you're saying, exactly that. I have clients coming up to me, oh, well, when you get to be my age, you can't do this, you can't do that. And when I tell them how old I am, well, it kind of <laughs> gives them a little bit of a turnabout. Yeah, and, and as well as you, you were saying about retiring, uh, turning 60, I have no want, wish to retire. I'm going to keep doing this as long as I can. Maybe I'll scale back my hours a little bit, but just doing this, it's not a job. I love being around people. I love talking to people, learning from my clients. I love talking to all you trainers. So all that keeps me going on the daily. I think that's really cool. So what is it? Okay. First question that I had a like kind of predetermined when you start first started working out, like when you first started going to the gym consistently, and I think nowadays is considered the cool thing to do for a long time. I think is like not, but back, back when you first started, like around what age was that? 17, 17. Uh, what got you into it? And was it a cool thing or was it kind of like, you know, you know, like nerds did not become cool until the Marvel <laughs> movies came out. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, I kind of worked out a little bit at home. Uh, I was away on holidays with family and I picked up, the stereotype picked up a muscle and power, which is now muscle and fitness magazine. I like what I saw. I worked out even more at home. I was too shy to join a gym at 17. So I paid for my brother to be my training partner. And both of us started at the community center. And from there I went to a gym. And when I was at a gym, I got approached by the instructor there who was a uh, Mr. Universe. So he took me under his wing. 
and uh, he trained me and as well as some other people as well. But uh, I went from uh, winning placing high in the Junior Mr. Quebec, Junior in Montreal to winning Junior Mr. Canada at 19 years old. And then uh, Senior Mr. Canada, fifth place when I was 20. And then after that, I gave up the competition, but uh, I've still been working out. So I've been working out consistently since I've been 17. So even to this day at now 60, I can't, I can't, I suck at math. So I can't really tell what's, was it? How many 43. years of working out? 43 years 43. of working out. So what, what keeps you going 43 years later from that point of 17 to now? What is that? I love working out. I love the way I feel. I like what it does mentally as well. Very big part is mental now. As you get older, you know, you want to stay on track with things as well. Uh, it helps keep up with your memory. So it's true what they say with your memory. Mind you, my clients will say, I don't know how to count, but that's something different. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think that's a personal trainer thing. I've heard the same thing. <laughs> so, yeah. So then, uh, yeah, I just absolutely love it. I love the way I feel. And then, you know, hoping that I'm an example to some people too, that, you know, age doesn't mean anything. You know, we all have aches and pains. I have aches and pains every day. It doesn't matter. You just work through it. You can keep going. Because imagine if you stopped how you would feel. You got nothing to stabilize all these issues. And uh, the thing I like it about too is with the younger people, um, helping them to ensure that they don't do anything correctly because you think you're invincible when you're younger. When you're older, all those injuries, they come back to haunt you later. And uh, it's, not a, it's not a good thing. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, so what is, a, and this is kind of like a two, two kind of parter on this one. So first part, <clears throat> What do you, when I got, I guess more specifically when you first started like training, training, like you were the coach. Uh, yeah. Cause I think that there's, I think when people are able to pass on the message or the exercise, the activity or the instruction yeah. that I think that when that transfer of information, that's when people find like uh, I call it confident competence or yeah, confident competence. So it's like you feel confident enough in something where you can teach it. And I think that that's like a, that's like a, an indicator of like the pursuit of mastery. So I think it's there. So from that point, so I guess when you first started to how you've seen trainers come into the world now, um, what is one thing that you recognize that m trainers present day? So January 11th, 2023, yep. what do trainers today have that you wish when you first started had back in the day? One or two uh, things, I uh, probably uh, being able to use and feel a lot more comfortable doing uh, using uh, like how you all use your tablets, your, com your computers, whatever you're out on the floor, things like that. For me, I'm still more comfortable doing pen and paper, writing it down. And I find it easier to watch a client as I'm writing something down as opposed to um, mm. taking time and using a tablet and putting in information. Probably the same thing. It all depends what you're more comfortable with. But for me, I find a lot faster, a lot easier to pay attention to my client as I'm just jotting something down. I can still see them up ahead past the clipboard or whatever. Uh, mm. For me, that's easier. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the one of the big things is just the fact of using uh, computers and things. Yeah, the tech. Yeah, the tech slide exactly. What is one thing? So for the second part of the question, what is one thing? or maybe a couple of things. What are some things that you recognize? That's a better way to put it. What are some things that you recognize that you had when you first started that trainers nowadays have lost? Uh, if there is engage, something. Well, maybe for some trainers, engagement, you always want to focus on your clients. You know, you don't want to be distracted by, you know, sure, we all, we all want to be um, civil and you're, you're nice to the people that are around you, of course. You know, you want to keep a good rapport with everyone, which is great. On, on the flip side too, you don't want to be standing around with your arms folded while your clients are doing something. You want to make sure you're engaged with your client, focusing on them and what they're doing and, you know, not being on your, uh, your tablet or whatever, when it's nothing related to the client or answering messages from other people outside of the gym, the clients with you, just take the hour, be with them. They appreciate it. They notice that. And not only do they notice that, people are always watching us when we're on the floor. It's like we're under the microscope all the time. So people notice that, oh, look at that trainer. This is how they interact and engage with that client. Oh, that trainer, well, you know, he's just lollygagging around. And so people always notice things like that. So it's all those little things. And, you know, it's, it, you want to keep up that rapport, that one-on-one -on -one with the client. So 
I think engagement is very important. Communication. I think you're, I think you're totally right on that one. Now that you mention it, like really thinking about it. <clears throat> uh, I think, I think you are certainly one of the more engaged. And when I interviewed uh, Dean as well, we were talking about, and he was saying the same thing where if you're there for the hours, it's, it, it's their hour, they're paying you to show up. So it's yeah. however, however we may feel about the day or the moment or whatever, we still have to show up for them so that we can help yes. be the, the, be the person it takes to help them get to where they want to go. And I think well, that's pretty sweet. Well, also, so Andy, too, oh, go ahead. sorry. Uh, also too, remember it's always easier to retain a client than it is to go looking for a new one to fill that spot. So you keep them happy. You do little things. They, they appreciate the little things. It keeps them on something little like that. That could be the last straw. And then that's it off we go to someone else or, somewhere else so it's just one thing to keep in mind that's a that's a really good thing to think of too so were you always a personal trainer um after i won the junior in canada people were coming up back then you there was no certification or anything so i was writing programs helping people with uh, their their routines and things like that way back then and then as we became certified then uh and back then too, I wasn't doing it for money. I was just a guy in a gym helping people out, you know, back, it's like a bodybuilder. And having said that too, just because you're a bodybuilder doesn't mean you know it all, but I was taught, I was taught form and everything. So I still believe to this day that form is first and foremost, load that form if it's correct after that. And so, uh, yeah, I've always been helping people along. And then when, one day at, when I was working at one of the commercial gyms, uh, a boyfriend and girlfriend couple approached me and said, Hey, we're taking the personal training course. Uh, why don't you take it? We think you'd make an awesome trainer. So I was already working full time. So I took the course and everything. I did really well in the course. And then uh, I started training people part time. I joined a commercial gym and was training people part time. So I was working full time and then three days a week working part time personal training people because that was my passion. And, and that's, that's what I love to do. And then, uh, yeah. That's pretty sweet. So, did, so you, I like how you kind of fell into your passion. Cause I think a lot of folks are really struggling with thinking of what their purpose or their passion or anything like that is. Uh, is there anything that you've recognized where maybe someone fell into it? Let's say someone hasn't fallen into their passion yet. How, what would you recommend someone do to find their passion? Start doing it as a part-time gig and then uh, sure. make the transition from there. For me, I was doing it part-time. And because I couldn't afford to make that jump into doing my passion full time because I had commitments I had, I had a mortgage, uh, I was married, I had kids, bring up kids. And then you had everything that, everything that the kids are involved in, all the sports and recreation and that, as well as school activities and, you know, showing up at school and being a parent teacher and all, all this stuff. So uh, after that, after that um, dropped down a bit and things changed and our financial thing changed a bit, then. I went full time uh, into personal training, and uh, I love it. And money will follow, no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. And it's true, money will follow you. So everyone's worried about money. Of course, it's, it's very, very, very important. Of course, to, to get by. But you know, if you're if you're if you're good, if you pursue something, you'll be recognized over time, and then you just get better. And then the more people will come up to you. And then in our business, it's clients. You get approached more and more. People, word will get around, word of mouth, networking, everything plays a big part. That's pretty sweet. So uh, being, being 60, being in the gym for 43 years, which sounds freaking cool. And I always say that I'm saying the numbers often because I think it's it's just something I think a lot of people need to recognize is like, it's a lifetime, it's a lifelong thing uh, and you're still crushing it to this day. And then people, I, and I imagine, I, I wouldn't be surprised if some folks thought you were actually just younger than 60, cause you move well, you lift well, you look well, you're freaking, you. you're, you're a dialed in fella. Thanks. So what do you recognize to see, or what do you see as some things that people get wrong about aging and exercise? Everyone's looking for the quick fix. Still, they're still looking for that magic pill. It's consistency. It's like you've talked about the other trans have talked about it's showing up on the daily. You know, if you, whether you do a little, you do a lot, you don't feel like working out, just come in and do something. Pick a couple of exercises. 
don't don't set up any uh, ideas. Just just go for it. Do what you can, and you'll find out the next day you'll be sore from those exercises. Uh, you'll leave the gym that day feeling awesome because you had no preconceived notions of what to cut, what was going to come out of that workout, and you came out feeling better. Yeah, that's totally fair. So for the folks that are also thinking like, I'm too old to start, what do you think to that? It's, you're never too old. Starting with a little bit, start with a walk, you, you, just a little bit, and it's going to go a long way. So no matter what you do, it's better than yesterday you not doing anything. That's totally fair. I think I like, uh, I think in my philosophy, I think folks are thinking too broadly or they're thinking too far into the future when they can't even, yes. when they can't even like organize the basics of the day. Um, what have been some daily uh, habits or tactics where if, if someone only focused on the day, what do you think would be some things that would just carry over things? Obviously physical activity. So outside of physical activity, because I was just an easy go-to, and I don't want to yep. give you too many easy answers. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. So, so with with uh, with, yeah, with that, what would you what would you recommend for a daily practice? And I think, and let me know if you think otherwise. But I think the daily practices is what makes it so that someone is working out for forty three years, kind of thing. You know. Oh, exactly. Uh, don't try and do everything at once. So, for example, this week start by drinking water. So I'm going to drink more water each day. Uh, the next day, you'll start thinking about what you're going to have for breakfast. Make sure you have breakfast. And just add things in little by little. That way, you're still getting that big goal in the end, but it's not overwhelming where you're setting yourself for, for, up for failure by saying, okay, I can do this, this, and this. And then everything just falls like the house of cards because mm -hmm. it's too much too soon. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing on that one. <clears throat> what have, uh, what, uh, Actually, how's the impact of um, being consistent with your own health? Because you're, it's, yeah, since you've been consistent with your health, own health for so long, even with your family, how has your uh, pursuit of consistent health, I, I'm just labeling yeah. it that, it's not really whatever, uh, how has that impacted your family? Because uh, you have a family, you have a wife, and you got I two do. kids, right? You betcha. So, my wife and I, just because we had kids, we didn't stop going to the gym. We were still going to the gym five days a week, even when we had kids, even when they were born, even when they were three months old. All we did is we took them to the daycare with us when we were at the gym. And we just, like other parents, you just check in on the kids as, as you're working out. That way you still can work out. You still carry on your routine. But my kids were old enough, or as they got old enough to not be in that daycare anymore, they said they didn't want to be in the daycare. They wanted to be out on the floor with me. So my son's been working out since he was 12. My daughter's been working out since she was 14. So he's 28 now. She's 25. So they've been working all these years. And it, I don't force them to go to the gym. They go to the gym. Uh, both of them are really good. They, they both meal prep and everything on their own. My son weighs out his food. I don't even weigh out my food. It's like I don't go that far. But I know, I know ideas. And my daughter, she, do, she does meal prepping. So basically they follow your example and that's all it takes for parents too. just a little bit like that. They have their own choices. They can do what they want. And just by you setting the example, uh, they, they'll follow through. And they've, like I said, they've been doing it all these years and they absolutely love it. My son used to be a really good soccer player. And once he got into young adult, he said, you know, I don't need this anymore. Some of the guys, they, they take it the wrong way when they're out on the field. You know, they, they're really aggressive. You know, it's not just soccer. It's something else about it. So he said mm -hmm. for him, it was in the gym. So he just spends more time in the gym. Oh, that's sweet. I really like that. I, I think uh, something I think is really interesting. Like Kendra and I don't want to have a family. So I don't think I would ever be like, uh, at least for immediate family, yep. a role model for a child. But I know like nieces, nieces for sure. I know I can be an absolute influence for there. But um. I, I honestly think like uh, wellness radiates outwards. And I think, uh, I think being a role model is so, so under undervalued where let's say, for example, I take on uh, a father and I'm like, dude, like work out for your kids kind of thing. Like be the role model to show them what's possible. Even if you don't believe in you, your kids have to believe in you. At least do it for that. Exactly. 
And I think that that's, I think that being a role model is, uh, is such a simple way to kind of like trick our brains into uh, doing the work that we don't want to. Yep, it is. I think that's a, I think that's a fun way of going about it. So who is your first kind of, what, what role does uh, mentors and role models play? Like when you started, even currently, obviously like we shoot the shit at, at the gym and then we like yep. learn from each other there. But when you first kind of started out, uh, because I guess when you first started out, that was when personal training was starting to become a thing, wasn't it? Yeah. You, you just had like people, people writing programs, uh, that worked in a gym that worked in a the gym. They weren't certified or anything back then. They wrote programs for you based on bodybuilding, what they knew or what they learned or what they thought was good and all this. And that's where we all know now some of the things that were done back then, it's not necessarily that they were wrong, but there are things that they can be improved on those, some of the movements, et cetera. Uh, so that was, that was back then. Um, so I had a guy that wrote programs for me and then my, the instructor that approached me in the gym and suggested I should compete. Uh, I always looked up to him and he's one that taught me about form. His thing is weight is great. Style goes a mile. So mm. that's my, that's always been my model since way back then. Uh, and Basically, uh, he's been my he's been a mentor. He's still a good friend. He still lives in Montreal. I I went. To, uh, he he lives in Montreal. He's got his own gym, his own personal training studio now, and he, I think, is 70, 71 odd, and he's still going at it. So he's still working out. He still has his own gym. Yeah, he's so. And I always look up to him. I'll feel forever grateful for what he's endowed into me. And I've taken this and passed it along. And he also taught me about uh, continuing to be humble and, you know, you know, show appreciation to everybody uh, because you're never better than the next guy. Even in the gym, you're not better than the next guy. You've got, you, you know what the gym atmospheres are, are like here and there. You've got, you've got some people act this way or that way. He says, you know, you just be your best you. And exactly, you're talking about energy moving outward. You have a positive energy like that. And that'll just keep, Ripple, put a ripple effect right through the gym. You want, you want, you want a good atmosphere. You got good vibes and everything. So just be that way towards people. You know, show appreciation and everything. Yeah, I, I love that. That's one. Th that's one thing that I think is really neat. Like, uh, I I have this kind of thought or this philosophy that kind of keeps me in check. Is uh, it's kind of funny. Like over time, we just kind of come up with you. Like how you have like your mantras that you adopted from your coach. And I think yeah. of the same ones and it's like, we're just like a build up of like different mantras just to keep ourselves in check. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I think it's kind of cool. So one, one thing that I think is kind of, uh, kind of neat with, I forgot exactly where I was going to go with that one. There wasn't, there was something there, but probably not. But one thing that I think is really cool with, um, the, the, oh, right. The fact that your coach guy is like 71. He's still crushing in the gym and running a gym. I find that with the health and wellness industry, there's probably a longer duration of per people working for the longest amount of time. So for example, like, uh, in the powerlifting world, they got Louis Simmons, right? Louis Simmons just passed right. away and he always said, he's like, I'm going to keep lifting until the day I die. Sorry about that. All good. 
it'll be just the first try it'll be the first time that i edit a podcast but that's about it it's all good you're all good uh oh yeah so something I think is really neat with uh, the the health industry, I think that's where we have the longest, the people working for the longest, like Westside Barbell right. for Louis Simmons for powerlifting. He he even said like he is going to keep on lifting until the day he dies. And he did. I think uh, who's another person like Corey Gregory out of uh, Ohio. Uh, he He's really heavily inspired by Louis Simmons as well. And he's the same kind of thing. He wants to keep on lifting. You're You're crushing it. Yeah, going into your 60s and comparatively i'm a little bit of a young buck but i'm gonna get there i'm gonna get there, gonna get there. <laughs> you sure are <laughs> yeah but i think i think in the health and wellness industry or the fitness industry that's where the the people kind of work the longest i think yeah i think that's kind of neat i agree i think it's probably because like there's uh there's a there's a persistence and there's like uh the want and the desire to just like kind of get a little bit better like you know it's like exactly. even I think that over a point, it's like, it goes less from how much can I lift to how much can I live? Right. And that's kind of a neat little, and that's kind of a neat little like reframe that I think most people kind of go with. I agree. That's so sweet. So when you're feeling like you really don't want to go to the gym, what are the, do you have a little mount mantra for that or a little mental trick, or is it just so ingrained in who you are at this point in time? That's just a normal thing. Well, I try and go and do something instead of nothing. There are days when I, I have given in and not gone, and I feel worse for the wear. So I feel you think you're saving yourself an hour or whatever, uh, you know, but that hour, you end up wasting that hour doing this or that. You get dragged in a bunch of different directions as opposed to if you'd gone to the gym and worked out, your focus is better, you feel better, you achieve that much more, you're more alert. So you're just basically shooting yourself in the foot. Fair enough. Do you think, do you think as you get into your like mid eighties and nineties, you're going to have a, a walker workout program? I think my kids are going to send me off to the old folks home with a wheelchair before that, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep on moving, doing things as long as possible. And that's the thing. When you've got older clients, I've got my clients range from 17 years old to 85 years old. And now you look at these 80, 85 year olds, 70 year olds think, okay, they're still X amount older than me and they're able to do this. I got to make sure that I keep doing what I'm doing. So I get to that age and I can still do this and do that. And that's what I mean. Like you're never better than the next person. You're still trying to make yourself better. So for me, it's to continue working out. So I get to be able to do that. That's the whole reason I kept working out when I was younger. I didn't want to be one of those dads that couldn't run around with their kids or couldn't play with their kids and pick them up and throw them. I wanted to make sure I, stayed up and i could do this i could do that uh i coached uh i didn't know anything about soccer my son started soccer at four years old i got snarled into being the coach i was a, a soccer coach from the time he was four until he was 16 so i didn't know a whole bunch about soccer but i knew about fair play and making the kids feel good and you know team spirit and team play and all that i still got people uh, a couple years ago i still got people stopping me on the street thanking me for how i was a role model for the kids one of the kids, one of the boys, he made it to uh, Canada's uh, team play in Spain. So just different things like that. So it's like you want to be the best you can be and, you know, uh, set the bar so that other people, so other people see what you can do. So they try and do the same thing. Did your, uh, did your parents uh, instill that kind of like work ethic in you or? No. Something well, you developed work yourself? Ethic, no. Work, no, work ethic, probably not so much. Neither of them were really athletic. Uh, trying to get my dad to come out and play pitch and catch and stuff uh, as we were growing up. He would still do it, but you could tell he didn't enjoy it. So we did our whole thing with my brothers and with our friends and stuff. Uh, work ethic, my dad had a good work ethic. So we got that from that. And that uh, carried over into bodybuilding and uh, just making sure I achieve. And also when I go, when I have my teeth locked into something, I just go. I've been that way since I was young and yeah, so I, that's why bodybuilding and then personal training and trying to help people. And that's the thing. I have a hard time saying no to people because I think, well, they're coming to me to help them. So I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to help them as much as I possibly can. And then, you know, you, of course, you know, you have to watch, watch yourself. You don't burn out or anything because you have to take care of yourself to give to others. So 
there's a there's an analogy that I like uh, when it comes to at least giving to yourself and that filling up the cup. I, I like thinking of it like a like a heart. Like the heart is like a bucket, and I'll, uh, there's more often than not where people want to go. They depend on the external, so like people or things to fill up that 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 uh, bucket heart. Yeah. with like feelings of love, for example. <clears throat> and I think when we switch it from like an external thing to like the internal to like f- fueling up our own like love, yeah. I think that when I think health and wellness definitely sticks with this, but when we're filling up our heart bucket so much and it's overflowing and other people, other people get that, I think that that's the, the purest, most amount of love. Cause I think it's when we can take it like internally and it's like, it's like, I, I would imagine by the time you're 70 and even by the time that I'm 60, right. I can think to myself, damn Kyle, like I really appreciate that you did that. Like worked out for example. Yeah. Right. And it's just an appreciation. It's like, thank you past Kyle. Thank you past Andy. And I think, uh, when people do things and recognize it, like, damn, I made a good choice back at that point. I think too many folks pay attention to the shitty choices that they've made and they stew on it. And it's like, why not like, look at the, why not make more good choices and look back at that and be like, damn, that was pretty freaking cool. I really dig that. I'm really glad that I decided to do that. Yeah. It's it's craziness. I think, I think that, I totally, I totally agree with that because it is a choice to check out the positive too. It's something that's really important that people don't recognize is like, I think that we get to choose to see more positive than negative. Agree. And I think when we get to see that positive, then we get to be like, oh yeah, I guess the world isn't all doom and gloom. If I just like put on the blinders and just focus yeah. on my own shit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, you got it. So funny. I, there's also something else I think is kind of cool. It's a, uh, and I talk about, and I kind of talked to a couple of clients about it, but you know how there's like generational wealth how there's people that try to like try to change the generational wealth of their family. So it's usually like comes from a poor family becomes wealthy. That way it goes like generation to generation, generation. I think, I think uh, something that you're introducing that's really cool is uh, the idea of generational health. Yeah. And so how you were saying like your parents weren't really into the whole health and wellness thing. And then you're being in the health and wellness thing and you're showing your kids that, and now your kids, kids are going to show them that. So I think you're, you're having the same kind of impact on something that's significantly more important than uh, wealth. I think health, exactly. I think health is wealth because if you don't get your health, like there's not, I think I would rather be in good health and homeless than stepping out of a Lamborghini with a big gut. Well, yeah, that's just my personal opinion. Yep. And, and you get that. You'll talk to people, I'm sure, that they've made all this money and now uh, they wish that they had made a little bit less money, taking more care, better care of their health. Because if they're walking, say they're walking in through Florida or California there with their wife and they've got a walker now, they've got all this money, but if they made a little bit less money, they'd be able to run or they play, play better golf or whatever. So mm-hmm. now they're looking back and uh, it's not that they – they have self doubt or anything, but they just wish they'd taken more of a piece of health into their instead of just blowing it up by the wayside and thinking making money, making money, having this, having that. Well, they have that, so they've got like you're talking about. They've got they've got monetary wealth, but personal wealth is a little bit lower on the downside on that. Absolutely, and it's just like it just. And once the health goes down, like there's a certain point where it's just like ah oh, shit. Yep. What do you think? Do you think that that's probably one of the more common kind of things where people look back and it's just like, I, sh- I wish I got into taking care of my health a little bit earlier? Well, sometimes I do that, but then I don't let them go too far down that road because then like you were just talking about the negative and the positive. <laughs> that negative, that's yesterday. The positive is you're in here today. You're doing all these choices. Think how much longer, think how much better your life is now by doing this, you know, you, you uh, you're taking better care of yourself. You're losing weight. You're getting more fit. Uh, you're able to do this. You couldn't you couldn't walk the same. You couldn't put your leg out in a movie theater because it, you had issues with your knees. Now just from coming in and doing a little bit of workout here, 
you, you feel great. You don't have to sit in the, the aisle seat anymore. You can sit in a regular seat and all these little things, just little things like that make a big, big difference. I totally agree. I say I totally agree a lot in this podcast. I think people are going <laughs> to notice it and be like, well, oh, have a shot every time Kyle says, I agree. <laughs> Uh, and then you have to chug your drink every time he says disagrees, <laughs> which is like less often, but it would still be kind of funny anyways. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So how do you, so at it, so how does it feel to be on a podcast? Is this your first podcast? This is my first podcast. And, uh, I honestly, I haven't listened to more than half a dozen podcasts yet. I should be listening for more. And that's my goal for this year is to do that. To listen to podcasts. So nice. rather when I'm doing something like something that's more mundane, just put a podcast and listen to it, driving to work, whatever. Folding laundry, folding laundry is a big one. Actually, any, any oh, cleaning. Yeah. I actually, yeah. you know what? I actually, I call it, it's productive procrastination. So let's say I don't want to do a work thing. Instead, I'll, uh, I'll put on a podcast and I'll just do cleaning. I'll just clean instead. See, that's a good idea. That's, a, that's yeah. an awesome idea. It helps. It's a little moment of mind fillness, filling up the mind. <laughs> yes. Right. I'll actually I'll send you a couple of podcasts I think you might like. I think well, awesome. maybe you won't maybe you won't like them. I'll just send you my favorite ones. There we go. Okay. That's a better way yeah, to go. It. I'm not sure if you'll like them, but I like them, so I'll just send yeah. them to you. That's pretty sweet. That good. So when you were growing up, uh, who were who were some of your role models? Who were the people that you looked up to? Obviously, there was like your coach, but like who were your just like. Uh, the, well, there are te- the teachers, uh, teachers probably in school. Some of them are role models in, in the fact that uh, they're dedicated to what they're doing and helping the students. And so there are a couple of people. But I remember an English teacher; he was really good at helping me. Uh, good. Uh, I don't know. My dad, I guess. Nice, nice. My dad with I his think, work ethic. Uh, yeah, fair enough. I think. Uh, <laughs> when was it that? The bodybuilding really started becoming a thing. It was around pump and iron, right? That was this 1977? Yeah. 70, yeah, 77, 75. Yeah. Uh, honestly, if I, if I got that date fairly right, I'm pretty impressed with myself. Yeah. Uh, did you recognize, because you that, uh, that was around the time that you, where would you have been at in your personal training career when that came out? <laughs> Ish. When pump and iron came out? I was... Uh... God, I was probably in grade nine. So I was working, I was starting to work out at home way back then. So just doing the usual, the bench and the barbell and all that stuff uh, back home. Okay, and it was uh, 1970, 1979, I think, 1980s when I first joined uh, a gym uh, or a fitness center or a community center. And then for that, it's a gym. So Sweet. that's way Do you think that there was... Back. Yeah. Do you think that there was a kind of like a, uh, an increase? Do you think that there, yeah, do you think there was an increase in like gym attendance, let's say after pump and iron came out, everyone just wanting to like scramble. I, that's what I've heard uh, at least. And I'm just curious. Uh, probably back then for guys more so get to the gym and getting that, uh, put it on the, the size and the whole giddy weight and muscle and stuff. Mm-hmm. So probably, I was, I was, uh, I think back then it was only 17, 15. And, uh, so around so, the time. Yeah, around that time. So the time that you, people just wanted to get freaking schwoll? Yeah, just, just eat any, and then that's the thing, nutrition and everything, and you ate, you drank, whatever you had. You knew guys drinking like, uh, like cod liver oil and everything just to get on size, put on size and put on weight. So it was just messed up back then. It's just. Yeah. And like, oh, different mindset. It's, it's like just go for it just go for it it doesn't matter just go that's for right. it yeah that's it that's, that's awesome. exactly it that's so funny what was this okay i got a pretty pretty fun one what was uh something that you may have been an early adopter of that you now are just like you just shake your head oh my gosh what were you thinking like one for myself uh pre-workout pre-workout when I was it was probably like earlier earlier 20s and that's when I really started going to the gym uh and then I would have pre-workout and it was NO explode and they still have an NO explode I believe it's BSN and oh my gosh man I had a whole scoop of that 30 minutes before a workout and 
I think I was in a warm up and I just, bleh, it was just horrible. But that was also like a cool thing at the time. Everyone's like, yeah, get your, get your, NO, get your pre-workout, your NO explode, your blah, blah. It's so, but now I look back at myself. I'm like, oh my gosh, you didn't, one, you didn't have to spend money on the pre-workout. Two, you're supposed to drink it at least an hour in advance so that you don't have a heart yep. attack. And yep. three, maybe like eat something, maybe like a banana so that you don't vomit it. Basically, it was the most expensive vomit. Yeah, no kidding. God, what a waste. Yep. Uh, but yeah, do you have do you have something like that where you look back at yourself and you're like, oh man, what were you thinking? Well, some things are the way you uh, perform some exercises. Like in, in the past, like chins behind neck were big, lat pull downs behind neck, things like that. Things that create, they find that create more shoulder impingement or can create mm -hmm. more shoulder impingement now. Mm -hmm. uh, being my nutrition, eating, the fact that we would make protein shakes and we'd use pineapple or apple juice as our mix. So you think about how many carbs, how many calories, how much sugar you're putting into your body. So sure you're gaining weight, how much of that's really muscle back then? So different things like yeah, that. Yeah, the scale's going up, but... <laughs> yeah, exactly. So my calories. It's not... Yes, yeah, so are the... <laughs> and, not, and not in the quads, not in the glutes, just that's in the wigs. Right. Yeah. Just in all the ways that you don't want. That's so funny. Yeah, yeah that's crazy. How many calories? That would probably be crazy. Like if you're doing it with orange juice and stuff like that, how many calories do you think you were consuming with a protein shake like that? Well, probably a thousand. Easy. Oh. You think you have two cups of pineapple juice and then you've got weight gainer in there and, and you've got all the other stuff there. Yeah, it's just crazy. Crazy. All that sugar. Yeah. And like sugar and fillers. Man, they got us good with yeah. the marketing, man. They got us good with the marketing. It's like, damn, that's so sweet. So my friend, we're at the top of the hour. We're getting pretty close to it. And I have uh, two questions. I don't think I sent them to you. So you're going in completely yeah. blind on this one. Sorry about that. But uh, I have two questions that I like to ask every guest. And yeah. the purpose of these questions is to uh, basically just try to bring out the number one, the number one tip. And then also uh, something that's a little bit more uh, just unique to to yourself. So uh, the first question, ready for it? Yep. Awesome. So you're on your deathbed, which will probably be another 60 years for you. So you're on your <laughs> deathbed. And then you have no content. Like this, for example, does not exist. Uh, there's like no books, all your notes that you've ever taken yep. for all of your clients that you may have, it's all burned away. You have no information. You're on your deathbed. You're sitting down. Your loved ones are around you. What's your lesson that you want to pass on? What's, what's a lesson that you're on your deathbed last words. This is what you want to provide people. Uh, always keep the lines of communication open. Uh, be be your best self. So be your best version of you. Uh, be humble. Uh, try and look at the positive always. Uh, treat people as you'd rather, as you'd have them treat you. Uh, that's it. Always try to make yourself better. You're never better than the next person. Beautiful. I love that. And then the final question of the episode is how would you define living a limitless life or a limitless life? Yeah. How would you think of when you think I'm limit, living a limitless life, what does that mean to you? Um, living a limitless life means uh, trying to remove any of those boundaries that are put up for you or that you put up for yourself and try and uh, work outside your comfort zone, like doing a podcast or something, you know, something like that, that, that you don't usually do. Uh, and I find that, that would, that's what help you live longer, you know, be positive, be your best version of you and uh, always try to step outside your comfort zone in some way. It doesn't have to be big. Just try it. And it always, it always, you always benefit from it. It'll always help you out in your future. Andy Sador, the man, the myth, the legend. Thank you very much for being on this episode. I'm super excited that you <clears throat> decided to jump out of your comfort zone and pop on this podcast. And that's also a reason as to why I started the podcast is because it's something I've been wanting to do for like two years. And uh, when I was interviewing Dan yesterday, he mentioned that he's like, yeah, it's been like two and a half years that you've been talking about it. And now you're finally doing it. And I think 
that stepping outside of our comfort zone is a really great way to develop and to have growth. And it's, it's awesome to see that at the age of 60, there's still opportunity for growth and it's well, not done. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Cole. You're an awesome host. Thanks for asking me to be on this. Uh, it was a lot of fun and I really enjoyed myself. Excellent. Great. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks again, guys.